Okay, welcome to the point of view. It's uh, live on CTTV. It's your favorite current affairs show. On this show, we bring the right guests to ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you, and we always go home with some useful insights. It's an interactive program. If you're watching on uh, social media, you can get in touch on the stream that's uh, below, and if you're watching on television as well, we'll be very happy to hear from you on the WhatsApp number we put on the screen. So, a week and a few days ago, the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, uh, addressed a town hall meeting in the Ashanti Regional Capital of Kumasi, where he gave a very interesting analysis of the performance of the new Patriotic Party government. We've allowed a few days to pass. We're going to subject some of the stuff he said to strict proof with two very similar but different guests. So it's going to be an exciting conversation involving my guest when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. So tonight we'll be trying to understand where we are as a country, not just from the perspective of the new Patriotic Party government, but it's also a comparison of records. As you know, the opposition party, the NDC, say that this government has failed and that they should be given another chance in the election that's less than a year away. We'll be talking to two key members of the two parties about the performance of the two political parties in government. Before I introduce my guests, let me take you to Kumasi. I'm going to show you highlights of what Dr. Mahmoud Baumia said to the room full of chiefs, MMDCEs, and other ordinary Ghanaians. He spoke about free SHS, spoke about the macroeconomy, and even the financial sector. Here's a flavor of what Dr. Baumia said last week. To allow access to the internet across public tertiary institutions and senior high schools, government has awarded the contract for the provision of free Wi-Fi to all senior high schools and tertiary institutions. There is so much knowledge. There is so much knowledge on the internet. And we have to allow our senior high schools to access that knowledge. And we promise free Wi-Fi, and we are going to deliver free Wi-Fi to all senior So that was about, we are talking about free SSS. He, he would also talk a bit about the banking sector and other issues around the economy. So let me take you to more of the things he said during that presentation in Kumasi. Reduce electricity tariffs we have delivered. Ensure procurement of new power projects are executed primarily through PPP and IPP arrangements we have delivered. Ensure there is sufficient reserve margin to ensure stability of our energy system we have delivered the most recent validation exercise that we undertook at the end of January 2019 shows that we have either delivered or we are delivering on 78% of our pro So welcome back to the show. So those are uh, highlights of Dr. Baumia. He says they have delivered. He gave himself 78%. We're going to quickly run through uh, the show. Let me introduce my guests. Two very interesting but different people. So let's start with the similarities. Um, the appearance took them to a seminary hoping they'll become priests. <laughs> Both of them decided to uh, ignore that calling to marry and have kids. So they both went to Pope John's seminary. They are both from the Eastern region. They both came from very interesting professional backgrounds. One is a doctor who decided to enter policies. The other is an entrepreneur, a journalist, lawyer, also turned politician. Other very interesting uh, things. So one of them grew up reading Das Capital, reading Che Guevara. He leans left, so he sat to my left. <laughs> and the other one read Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. He wanted to be a businessman. So they're sitting to my right. And politically as well, Omani Buama leans left and uh, Opon Kuma leans right. We're going to try and see how to bring them together on the show. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Thanks. Bernard. I'm sure your produce um, WhatsApp platforms are buzzing. <laughs> I see. Uh, so it's welcome to the show, and it's good to have you. It's good to know that you went to a good boys' school, so you behave very well. And so maybe let me start with um, where government feels we are, because I think that's very important. So I just played a couple of uh, videos of Dr. Baumia. He spoke of free SHS spoke on the banking sector, but he really started by talking about the macroeconomy. And then he sort of ended by talking about the percentage delivery 
where he listed over 300 promises and their delivery. Now, I'm sure you are part of the architects of this program. So give us a quick insight into why you chose to make it both a, an economic conversation and also a manifesto conversation. Why you chose the town hall format and what was the thinking behind some of the things he highlighted? So Bernard, um, thanks for the opportunity and uh, good evening to um, Homani and to your viewers. Um, I'll backtrack a little. The mandate of the Ministry of Information essentially is to create platforms that allow government to engage its various publics. One of the innovations that we've uh, brought uh, is the town hall meetings that allow key government officials to be out there to speak to major issues and engage the country in a conversation because we believe that our politics must be more about issues, verifiable data, things we can agree on, policy uh, conversations. Um, now, what we have done with this first town hall meeting, the first in a number of town hall meetings we'll be having this year, is to give the administration an opportunity to do something novel, which is to go back to its social contract or the foundation of its social contract mm -hmm. with the people of Ghana. Okay. And remind ourselves of what we promised at the time we were looking for power and to account to the people for how much of that we have delivered or we are in the process of delivering. And the legend to that chart essentially is that when we say we have delivered, what we mean is that we've completed it. When we say we are delivering, we are yet to complete it. Mm -hmm. And also in all humility, to be able to explain to the people of Ghana what we have not been able to touch so far, which is what we call pending, and if we have a good rationalization of why uh, uh, do so. So we believe that between the exercise of providing information and also deepening our democracy, it is important to do these town hall meetings to engage various publics on things like, as a foundation conversation, our 2016 manifesto. Mm -hmm. That is essentially the rationale behind okay. uh, what we've started. We, we did a, a bit of an analysis of the areas of focus at City News, and we noticed a large chunk of this was the, <coughs> the macroeconomy, yeah. And then there was something on the banking sector. And then we saw that he also spent some time talking about free SHS and social programs. And then he also discussed digitization. And then he ended up by then talking about we have delivered. Any idea behind those areas of emphasis? For example, there wasn't much on infrastructure, for example. What was the thinking behind those areas of emphasis? So we have already mentioned that our second town hall meeting, which should take place, I think, maybe somewhere around early April or late mm -hmm. March, will focus squarely on infrastructure. Good. And so what we did was not to include so much infrastructure detail in this one. But, you know, for any party in government, any administration, and I'm sure Omani would recall mm -hmm. around 2008 when they came to power, mm -hmm. one of the first things you need to do mm -hmm. is to check the macro foundation of the country, okay. what you call in economic terms the macro fiscals, yes. and ensure that if you inherited things at a time when the macro fiscal situation was abysmal. A, you restore. Mm -hmm. B, you bolster or maintain stability. Why? Mm. Because it is upon that stability that you are now going to build your entire programming. In the economic area, things like growth, which will come with jobs and incomes for people in the public goods and services area, in social services, but ultimately to ensure that people can get a higher quality of life. So like I think the AFDB boss recently says, nobody eats macro statistics. That is true. But it is an important foundation, which if you don't get right, you can't do anything up there. So it was strategic for us to spend some time starting off on the macros that we inherited and what we've done in the last three years and two months to bring the macro to a stable point and to bolster this macro. And at the same time, begin to deliver the elements of growth and quality of life improvements that we promise. So there's a method to what you, you may call the madness, mm -hmm. uh, and it is deliberate to set a certain foundation, show where we have come from, where we are, and what remains uh, to be completed. All right. Uh, Doc, what are your initial comments watching this as a former Minister of Communication who used to be quite instrumental in your own government's time? Because I recall you were quite forceful with the Green Book, and you used to sometimes come on interviews with a, a lot of material, pointing out what your boss had done, observing the NDC, MPP, Dr. Baumi and Co., what was running through your mind? What were your initial thoughts as you watched the, the, the program? Yeah, thanks very much, Bernard. And hi, Kudu. And a very uh, good evening to your cherished viewers and listeners out there. Mm -hmm. 
I think that for government to want to be accountable and to go around the country to speak to the good people of Ghana is something that we also did. I remember very well the G4P series of programs, that is a government for the people mm -hmm. forum. And so it didn't come to me as a surprise. Mm. However, what came to me as a surprise is the fact that I think Dr. Baumier's presentation was politically pathetic, academically anemic, and flagrantly dishonest. Hey. Yes. I mean, Can you repeat that? It was politically pathetic, uh -huh. academically anemic, and flagrantly dishonest. Hey. And what do I mean by the fact that it is politically pathetic? Mm. Bernard, we have a situation where our vice president kept on churning 78% and we have delivered. 78% we have delivered. As we speak, the denominator itself is being contested. Whereas government puts it around 388, Imani Ghana is around 500 and over. So when you are dealing with fractions and percentages, for every student of mathematics, you don't have to even have had free SHS to want to know that when denominators are in dispute, you are going to have a very serious issue riding on the back of the percentage that they quoted. And I will list a few of the unfulfilled promises. They said they will achieve double-digit GDP growth annually. Mm -hmm. They have not been able to achieve that. They said they will reduce corporate tax from 25% to 20%. They have not been able to achieve that. Mm -hmm. They said savings from the reduction of interest rates paid on the country's debt stock will be made. They have not been able to fulfill this from their own budget for the year 2020, this year alone. Mm -hmm. They are going to pay as high as 20 billion Ghana cities, which is unprecedented in our history. And this is also because of the unbridled borrowing that we have seen under President Akufuado's administration, ballooning the national debt. Mm -hmm. They also said they were going to eliminate corruption. The most credible institution internationally, globally accepted, is the Transparency International. It is trite knowledge that the worst performance of the President Mahama administration on the CP index is better than the best performance of President Ekufuado. So when you talk about elimination of corruption, especially in procurement of goods and services, etc., that one too, they've not been able to achieve that. They also said they will provide tax and related incentives for manufacturing businesses in sectors such as agro-processing, light industries, mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, and all that. And if you tie this also even to what we did, and I'm very glad to see NS chemists these days churn out the chain of outlets that we are seeing across the country. If you recall, somewhere 2014, 2015, the President Mahama administration invested millions of Ghana cities into NS chemists, into Tobinko, into Dan Adams. And so I'm happy to be seeing some of these. I'm yet to see the kind of um, investments that we made even in just those three or four pharmaceutical industries, they equaling that or surpassing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm also yet, and I'm very sure by the end of this program, my dear brother Kojo will look into the cameras and tell us how many of the factories, one district, one factory, that they promised in the various districts. Remember, it is one district, one factory. And remember the modification of retooling, repainting existing factory was not the campaign promise. Mm -hmm. It's because Pinti Maminto is not what we are dealing with here. We are talking about starting <laughs> factory. Pinti Maminto is not what we are dealing with here. We are dealing with starting factories from scratch. And in your fourth year, how many of them they have completed? Mm. And talking about factories, my brother, I'm very, very sad what they have done to Raymond Aches printing um, factory today. And I believe when time permits, we will you delve into spend that. some time on it. Again, they also talked about implementing policies that will reduce the cost of doing 
business. Mm. I mean, look at the way they cannibalized VAT almost to the extent that AGI had cause to complain and wrote a letter to the Ministry of Finance in the year 2018 mm. and indicated that this was going to increase the cost of production and hence the cost was going to be passed on to consumers. Subsequently, it even affected products all, all the way to simple yogurt that not many people will even be patronizing. Mm. And if I may add, even beer was also affected. I remember one of the breweries issued a statement talking about that. And so if you look at this, and I can go on So and what on you have, what you have is just on, the, on, the, on. But how many, how many <clears throat> promises are on this document? I mean... Is this the 380 or the 500 this, one? Or these are just a, a flavor of... Just a flavor of unfulfilled promise. And I can go on and okay, on and so on. So what I'm going to do. Let's start with on, macro. I mean, Since that's, you, you touched on a few macro things. So let's do macro briefly. You did say that the debt accumulation was high. You said they promised double digit growth. They didn't have it. You haven't even talked about the exchange rate yet. Could you, Dr. Bamiya spent about 36% of his time talking about the macro economy. And you're saying that for you, for a first term in government, the macro is key. Yes. Um, what are the, what's the basis for the confidence that you've, you've changed the macro situation? Give me some of the highlights. I will come to that very shortly. First, I want to tackle this claim that um, the, 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 the administration says it's made 388 manifesto promises. And I listened to um, Omani carefully says, but Imani says it's over 500. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can work with that, you know, um, comment just as a goal. Mm. What has Imani said is 500. Imani has said that they count over 500 promises that the MPP made in its quest for power. That's my understanding of what they've said. We have been very clear that we are measuring 388 manifesto promises. I would have been happy if Omani would have started off by saying that they have counted as an opposition party that seeks to hold us to account and that they have found that it is not true that we made 388. He hasn't said that. It is not true. So what is the figure? It is over 500. Give us a figure. They haven't done even that job. We I'm have... telling you on authority that what we... And, and, and I want to ask City to do that count yourself. It's 388. We have taken time to count their manifesto promises in their first term in 2008. It's 299 promises. And if we have some time, I'll show you how much of that they delivered or were delivering by the time their first term was ended. So I'm saying that as we're starting this conversation, it shouldn't be based on, you know, somebody says, somebody says. It should be based on hard data that we can defend. That's the first matter. The flavor, he uses the word flavor, of unfulfilled promises, well, for me, it's not surprising. We have ourselves mentioned that there are about 22% of our promises that we are here to deliver. So if you spend your time cataloging those ones, you are still missing the point that about 78% of these manifesto commitments that we made have either been completed or about to be completed. Now, again, he states another factual inaccuracy that um, the worst performance of Mahama in corruption is uh, the best performance of Akufuado. That's, CPI. That is laughable. Why? It's laughable because anybody who follows the CPI score reports will tell you clearly that if you look at where President Mahama took over from, a new president with a new breath of life, somewhere I think around 40-something percent after Kufu, around 47 percent, and you look at most importantly where he ended, because as a new president, it's easy to start one or two things that look glamorous in the eyes of people, and your score will look high. The most important thing is how you end up, and look at where President Mahama ended. And look at where President Akufuado has picked up the case. I would have thought that he would have spoken about where President Mahama ended. And I want to challenge him to look at President Mahama's last year's score on corruption. Those were the days in which he was receiving cars and claiming they were gifts and several other corruption issues. So when it comes to corruption, I'm not sure that he can even run into CPI matters as a source of defense. But to be specific, on the macro, again, if you go into our manifesto, we said one item that we will restore macro stability. And I've explained why it's important. And I'll give you just a few numbers that demonstrate clearly. These are not my saying, so these are official numbers from various government institutions, A. B, official numbers that have been validated by a cross-section of economists and international agencies. Take growth, something as simple as growth. In 2015, when Mr. Omani Buama was um, communications minister, the NDC administration under John Dramani Mahama recorded growth of about 2.2% real GDP growth. 2016, when they were leaving power, it was around 3.4. By 2017, we brought it up to 8.1. 2018, targeting around 6.3. In the 2019, at least the provisional figures that we are looking at, almost hitting 7%. 
And this 2020, we are looking at about 6.8% growth. Here's what is significant. When you have found countries that have been able to leapfrog out of poverty, like China, etc., it's because they were doing an average of about six, seven, eight on a consistent basis. The numbers speak for themselves. And if you go into the various indicators, benchmark by benchmark, from agriculture to industry to services, I have the budget here, I think page 170, the 2020 budget. We can spend a whole day going through those numbers. You'll begin to see where the growth is coming from. This claim that sometimes they make that all the growth is driven by oil, totally not true. Because you find it across about 10 of the 20 uh, economic areas that the Ghana Statistical Service measures. Take inflation. The rate at which the prices, I mean, general price levels in the country go up. In 2016, when they were exiting power, inflation was at 15.4%. Today, inflation is sitting somewhere around 7.9%. When you say, they will say, oh, it's because you've used the new basket of boot, you can extrapolate backwards and find out whether indeed the trend or the curve has come down or not. Take even the depreciation of the currency, and the vice president spent some time to situate this you know, issue of the currency depreciation in a good context. Now listen, Ghana's currency for many years has had a set of challenges. And we have mentioned that we are going to put in place programs to literally, within the context of a floating exchange rate regime, arrest the rapid depreciation of the currency. And the data, I've not heard them contradict the data. That's why we keep saying, come with your data, not somebody says, somebody says. So Jerry Rawlings first term um, as a democratic government, 93 to 96. Average annual rates of depreciation of the city, 27.9%, about 30%. Jerry Rawlings, second term, 97 to 2000, 25% depreciation, annual average rate of depreciation. 2001 to 2004, John Ajikun Kufo, it slows down to 11%. 2005 to 2008, Kufo, second term, that's 6.77%. Go to the Mills Mahama era, 2009 to 2012, it shoots back up to 10%. 2013 to 2016, Mahama Simpliciter, 18%. So far, on the Akufo administration's watch, the average annual depreciation of the CD is not zero. We haven't said that. It is 8.73%. It's the second best in our country's fourth Republican dispensation. This data has not been controverted. I can spend time going through benchmark by benchmark of all our, whether it's interest rates, whether it's, um, you know, uh, even, even, even our debt dynamics, which we shall spend some time on um, later, or our trade balance. Positive now. Primary balance, for example, which shows whether your primary expenditures, you are able to fund it with your primary revenues. He will not dispute the fact that on their watch, primary balance was in negative. Three years running on our watch, the primary balance is positive, which means that we are raising more revenue than we need to spend on our primary expenditure items. That's a more responsible fiscal approach. So the data speaks for itself. Now, here's what's even critical. Two things. This is not data that we are disputing. Because all over the world, this data is accepted. We're just on the uh, global markets for a roadshow. And it translates into the cheaper rate you are getting. It translates into the high levels of subscription. Even when you say you want X, you're probably getting X times 3 or X times 4 on the table. It translates into the ratings, upgrades, and outlook changes, positive outlook changes that the economy is getting. The only people who seem to dispute these macro figures are my colleagues on the other side. But we acknowledge that macro, nobody they chop. But it is necessary mm. to establish it so that it can build the okay. growth on it. We I'll, don't have to spend too much time. I'll give him a quick rebuttal on the economy. What, what, what I wanted to say was that I've done my first fact check, and I'm going to put the Corruption Perception Index from 2009 to 2019 on the screen for the viewers to see themselves. Yeah. So, I have projected it here. so I'll, I'll put it on the screen for us. It's not now. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that up. I just mm -hmm. called. Yeah, so that I, do, I don't want to just sit and listen to people just talk. So we'll show you the figures so you decide for yourself yeah. because I have the figures here. But I just want to give you a two-minute quick yeah. response to the macroeconomy before I take my first break. We're trying to just understand where we are. We have about three areas to go yeah. through. Just, Macro. Bef just before you come there, mm. on the CPI, I'm wondering how Kojo can see... 43. Which year is this? 2016. Yeah. 43. Mm -hmm. Scored by the Mahama administration mm -hmm. as inferior to 40. Scored in 2017 by the Akufuado administration. You made mention of a new government. So if your assumption of a new government is to be taken seriously, then do you expect it to have been 40? No. Do you get it? My next point is, 
How can you expect 41 in 2018 to be better than 43? But you jumped the 2017 figure. I'm at 2017. It's 40. No, no. And you just now mentioned 40. No. I mentioned you see what earlier. you tried to do. You, you said 43. No, no, don't confuse That was 2016. No. And then you jumped to 2018. Look, don't worry, no. I'll put the figures I, on the screen. I, I have it here. 43, don't worry. I'll put it on the screen very soon. 40, 2017. Thank you. How can you say 40 is better than 43? But when did Pope they measure the 40? Teach, no, no. Pope when did John they measure the 40? Pope John did not they teach you that. They reported 40 in 2017. I come. What is the period of measure? Okay, hold on. Let's just be clear. Let's not confuse listeners, Doc. Yeah. For corruption perception index, the higher the figure, the better. Yes. yes. So if you score the score, low, it yes. means you are not doing well. Yes, exactly. that's true. Very good. I have the figures here. There's another yeah. question. I also have them here. Just before you go. Yes. There's another question. When Could is you... the data gathered? Don't, don't. No, it is relevant. Don't For example, when was the 2019? No, 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 no. I'm don't not misinterpret. When was the 2019 data gathered? You give me two minutes. Don't he's, worry. No, let us establish this. It's very important. I'll come back to the CPI because it's very I have the figures here. He's, when was the 2019 data gathered? No, that's a different question. Let's just say what he's saying. It's very good. So that's a different matter. So I'm saying it's that not. under no circumstance, yeah. okay, can you be seen 40, 41 as superior to 43? But what nobody kind of, has said that. What kind of mathematics Nobody is that? has said that. I come to my next point. No, no, don't jump no, from my next point. point. No, no, no. I think my he said that point, yes. the best year, the worst year under Muhammad mm -hmm. was better than the best the year best, under Kufu. No, no. Muhammad's ending point was 40. That's the point I'm it making for him. It was. It was not 40. Listen. How, how the, so? Okay. 2019, no, 2020. Let's yeah. use 2020. When was the data published? When was the data gathered? 2020 data as published. It's gathered in 2019. So you are saying that... When you see... Says who? Call, what, is, what, what is your source? Call DIA. What is your source? source? You are when you see... Please, no, no, please, no, 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 but please. Don't, this is, don't this is data issue. everybody Let knows. me come to statistics. No, no, wait. I'm let going me land. Don't run away from me. I'm going to go. Let me land. I'm going to land. I'm going to land. We are waiting. We have already landed. Please, please. Please. So Muhammad's score is 40. 40 can be better than 41. And has brought it to 41. Okay, I'm going to quote Sanders and Smith on how persuasive artists misuse statistics. Okay? Yes. I'm going to quote just briefly. Okay. They said that many have uncritically accepted statistical conclusions mm. only to discover later that they've been misled. They are very interesting points, but I will mm. move on to the later points that they make. Okay. Consumers of statistical information, uh -huh. you and I, must be alert to the argument that because B follows A, B was caused by A. So, because GDP growth of 8% followed President Kufuado coming into office in 2017, <laughs> it means that President Kufuado is the one who caused that but GDP go by that growth argument, rate of 8%. Then your corruption 8, argument doesn't hold. GDP growth rate of 8%. Okay. Let's decompose that GDP growth rate of 8%. And let him tell us the oil component of that GDP growth rate of 8%. That is one. My second point has to do with the fact that Sanders and Smith is cautioning us against such misuse of statistics. And at one point, he was going for averages. If you are to go for averages and to look at the political party that has the best track record in terms of average GDP growth, then it is not the MPP. It will be the NDC. And that is why you must be careful about going for averages in these things. My point has to do with the fact that the GDP growth rate that we are seeing, Bernard, you are a student of economics and a very good one at that. Anyone who was watching the economics of Ghana in 2016, 2015, 2016, knew that with a capital injection in the ENI fails, in the 10 fails and all, we were going to have a precipitous jump in our GDP. Even if a kangaroo was the president of Ghana, <laughs> we were going to see an appreciation because of the enormous work mm. that President Mohammed's administration had done. Mm. And this is where the MPP makes a very grievous mistake. Mm -hmm. Where they begin, it's on page 41. Yeah, people want about, to see the book. Where so they begin, the where the MPP begins to even confuse causal association with causality. That because there was a causal association of 8% growth in GDP, therefore, the causative factor is the fact that President Akufuado became president and his robust policies led to that. 
And when we get to the level of the exchange rate and borrowing, you also get to appreciate how Dr. Baumia uses statistical averages, mm -hmm. rates, and all that to try and okay. confuse. So let me let me take a short break. When we come public. back, we'll deal with exchange rates and then borrowing. Those are two of the key macroeconomic issues. We would also, would also, would also, 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 we've also fact-checked the um, uh, correction percentage index, and I'll show you the, the real figure. This is the point of you stay with us. Welcome back to the point of view. We're trying to understand where we are with this government and their performance in comprising to the largest opposition party in the country, Dr. Manibu Amma from the NDC, Kujo Ponkroma from the government, the MPP. We've spent a bit of time arguing about the CPI. And I, what I have in front of me, I'll just read for you. 2009 was 39. Now, for CPI, the higher the figure, the better. 2010 was 41. 2011 was 38.5. 2012 was 45. Now, let's come to Mahama. 2013, 46. 2014, 48. 2015, 47. 2016, 43. 2017, 40. 2018, 41. 2019, 41. Now, if you average Mahama, 43, 47, 48, 46, that's pretty high than Akufuado, 40, 41, 40. So it's very clear that the corruption perception index was better in Mahama's time than Akufuado's time on the basis of averages. If we bring on the mills, basis of averages. Yes, if we bring in mills, on the that's basis a different, of averages. Yes, if we bring in mills, that's a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think we can move on. Yeah. Now, no, 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 we don't have time, please. No, no. I beg I'm you. I only really have an hour. I'm no, it's okay. I'm on a national note. No, I'm saying, no. You see, I don't, no, I we'll do that later. If it is 40, it's not things. enough. Debt. We must aspire to do better yes, as a country. And I agree with you. Guys, debt. You, Dr. Bamiya said, debt accumulation under this government has been the lowest since record started, I think he's trying to say. And then he also said that the exchange rate has the city has depreciated less within this period. Which is what I just went through before the break. Yeah. The uh, depreciation of the currency. Yeah, I want to just strengthen the argument a bit. Okay, I'll come to that. I just want to give you one bit of data. The Corruption Perception Index report oh, was published. Back to CPI. It, this oh. data was published on <laughs> the 24th. Don't worry, don't worry. It was published on the 24th of oh, January no. 2020. The data was gathered in 2019. I'm saying to you that the 2017 data that he's talking about was gathered in 2016. And, no that, and that is what is called. Okay, so, and, so, and I, I'm saying so you I can't say that. So I say you take 2017, 2016, 2015 and give that to You should always Muhammad. ask when they gather the data. And I'm saying that Muhammad's end it score is relevant, was 40, not, speaking based not on fact. 43. You, you can check it. No you are worry. Now let me come to the issues of dead dynamics. <laughs> you know, um, one of the things that our colleagues in the NDC have tried to do over a period is to make this claim that the MPP said it will never borrow, which is not true. The MPP made the argument that a certain over-reliance on borrowing is inimical to our national interest, and that there's a lot of domestic resource here that can be mobilized so that we reduce our dependence on borrowing. What was the data on debt before the MPP took over? And what does the data on debt say after the MPP took over? And I'll refer you to two major things. There's the nominal CD debt stock. And I think the last time I was here on your show, we had some time to uh, even debate that. The nominal CD-based debt stock, which very often I see my colleagues run to and say, ah, that is evidence. But last time I saw one of them divided by the population and say, yes, it means every Ghanaian owes, I think, 6,000 or 7,000. Again, that's laughable economic analysis. What you are always looking out for is what we call the debt sustainability analysis. So the key thing you want to look out for is what is the status of the debt sustainability analysis. Now, if you go to page 10 of the vice president's presentation, he traces a certain track record about two major things. The change in the debt stock, the change in the nominal debt stock, okay? And most importantly, the debt sustainability analysis benchmark that we have all used in this country for a very long while now. Now, you notice that between, let's say, 2008 and 2012, the change in our debt stock was about 267%. If you check from this 9.7 CD nominal to the 35.6, you check from 2012 to 2016, that is from 35 to 122 in CD denominated. That change alone is about 243%. 2016 to 2019, um, uh, where it ends about... 203.9 billion. That's about a 67.1% change in the nominal debt stock. Now, mm -hmm. why 
we say that even the nominal is not as huge as the change in the debt stock is because it shows you the rate at which we are accumulating debt. If you are accumulating debt at some of these 200%, 67%, 267% numbers, you need to um, disaggregate and see who has got a huge appetite for borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and who is literally slowing down the rate of debt accumulation. Now, here's a critical thing. One of the most important measures for debt sustainability is a debt-to-GDP ratio analysis. And when it comes to debt-to-GDP ratio analysis, there's a key argument I want to put out here. It's like going to the hospital and taking your temperature. Mm -hmm. What you see is what informs you. Mm. Not what future thermometer is um, invented. Mm. So if at the time you are borrowing, the global benchmark says that you should not borrow beyond 60% of your GDP. Mm -hmm. And you borrow to 73% of your GDP. And you say that it's a smart borrowing. How do you turn around and argue with somebody who on his watch, the data available to us is that even in the worst case scenario where you add the banking sector recovery issues, the energy sector recovery issues, debt to GDP ratio six at 62%. You cannot sustain that argument. That argument is totally laughable. And the way they run out of that argument is that, oh, don't worry, let's rebase backwards. And that if you rebase backwards, uh, in our day, debt to GDP would have been about 55%. And I say to anybody who makes that argument is that if you buy that argument, then what you are telling the MPP government is that we might as well also borrow to 70 something and 80. Why? Because in the future, when they invent a new thermometer, when they rebase, our current 62 may also go down a bit. Uh, more. The relevant thing is what you see at the time you are borrowing. So just to be clear, do you think increase in debt stock is more important than debt to GDP or both are equally important? Both are equally important. The increase in the debt stock tells you your appetite for borrowing. So if you have an administration that is increasing debt stock by about 267%, okay. while we agree that downplay the nominals, that sheer rise shows you the appetite for accumulating debt. Where we are coming from. It does. But it also shows the rate at which you are growing up some more debt. That is one indicator. So based on your argument, 2012, increase in uh, debt, 49, in, in 2016. No, this is percentage, percentage increase, increase in debt to GDP ratio. This is different. Good. You are looking at the change, change in, in the stock. debt stock. These so are the numbers. 267. 267% growth in our 2016, debt 2016, 243. 2019, 67. You are seeing a slowdown. 76.1 is when you include the financial sector and then the um, 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 energy uh, about one billion of energy sector payments, both items which had not been budgeted for, and then you needed to borrow. And so you think you look at the change in the it debt is stock? It's one of the key not indicators. the absolute debt. I, I have always maintained. We have always maintained that the CD based I mean, the CD based debt stock is a deceptive enterprise because of the exchange rate. Of course, look at. But you manage the exchange rate yourself. As well. Yes, like yes, yes, and that becomes another thing we will look at. <laughs> We'll look at the exchange rate depreciation over the period. Okay. Okay. Because Explain your exchange rate argument. I understand your debt argument. What are exchange rates? What's, now, your, what's your main Well, concern? again, for exchange rate, I think just before we went on the break, I spent some time to go through it. And yes. we have done um, the numbers over the last, um, um, is it 20 years or so, since we came into the mm. um, Fourth Republican um, dispensation, looking at on whose watch. And I just went through it briefly from Jerry Rawlings' watch to Kufour 1, mm -hmm. um, Kufour 2. And the data is quite clear. The best period for slowing down or arresting the depreciation of the CD in a floating exchange rate regime was that of Kufo in the second term, about 6%. The second best so far in the last three, and, three years and two months is the um, Akufuado um, uh, okay. Baumia enterprise, which is just about 8%. Okay. Compare that to the 25% and the 26% okay. average. Let, let, let me try and understand your concern about debt accumulation yeah, yeah. and exchange rate. Yeah. Yeah. Bernard. Do you remember a man called Sir Isaac Newton? Oh. <laughs> who, 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 who invented calculus? I'm sure he'll be very sad in his grave. The way Dr. Baumia is misusing small changes. Mm -hmm. I want to give you, and I'm, I'm always glad to have a very enlightened host like you and a very enlightened um, partner. Aspiring partner. Yeah, like you. <laughs> We're a very good school, probably not secondary. <laughs> let's assume, okay, and let's use a very simple figure, that the national debt, okay, mm -hmm. in a certain test tube, is 10 billion Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. So please, I put that down. Mm -hmm. Kudo, you may also help in this exercise. Okay. 
if a government decides to be reckless, mm -hmm. to borrow 10 billion Ghana cities in addition, what is the percentage increase? I think that's 100%. That's 100%. Yes. So if your national debt is 10 billion and you borrow 10 billion in addition, that's 100%. Yes. So now what's your total debt now? 200. No, 20, 20 billion. Sorry, 20, yes. Very good. 10 plus 10. Assuming that next year the government decides to borrow higher than the 10 billion that it borrowed the previous year. Mm -hmm. So it borrows 15 billion. Mm -hmm. It's going to be 15 billion out of the 20. Out of the 20 billion. Do you realize that is 75% yes. increase? Yes. But it's not 100%. Yes. Will you tell me that borrowing 15 billion is less than 10 billion? So we should use the just, absolute increase in just the debt, because, not yes, the percentage just because, on the previous. Just because the increase of 10 billion gave you 100% and 15 billion has given you 75% increase. Do you now understand why when I started? So you reject I said the percentage? Denominators matter okay. so much. Okay. I absolutely, with all the energy I can command, mm -hmm. reject Dr. Baumier's then misuse. Then you need more energy. Do Dr. Baumier's, <laughs> Dr. Baumier's misuse of those kinds of percentages. You need more energy. My mm -hmm. brother, and I'm not sure Kojo was listening carefully to Dr. Baumier when Kojo was sitting in your position in the sister station. The person who introduced the discussion of our national debt and mass in cities is Dr. Baumia. Even at that time, we raised it. I share your opinion. I think that he was reckless. He was irresponsible as an economist. And he is, I'm told, that if you put the politics aside and he wants to do proper economics, he can do it. But he is the one who introduced this whole city. So it doesn't matter whether it's in dollars or that. He just took the exchange rate and converted those that were being held in dollars to cities and added that to the cities. Today, you are here. You have profited from it. And you want to change the goalpost. We haven't. You obviously didn't understand, you understand. this question. So my point is that this government, okay, has borrowed, and if you add the current euro bond to it, okay, they have borrowed as much as over 200 billion Ghana cities. 225 billion Ghana cities. That is okay. not true. Okay? That is not if you, true. If you add the current euro bond <laughs> to it, okay, and they will so say... So you are converting they, they everything say, into cities? The formula. So now we are using that method. <laughs> the okay. formula. Let me tell you. No, no. What do, you finish, finish. This is my time. No, finish, finish. Okay. They will say that, oh, it is 122. They inherited 122. We don't take the figures from you. The Auditor General is the primus in Tapari when it comes to these things. Okay. So their figure is 120. Okay. And that is what. Let me do something. By. Let me do something to help Again, us. Let me just wrap up on the debt. Yeah. The exchange rate. On the debt. My brother. What debt is, sustainability. What analysis. is. Yes, debt sustainability analysis. Right. If we are to look at the new series, we are at 55 percent. You are at 62 percent. But this is your excuse. What are you talking about? This is your excuse. Why? At the time you were born, don't, don't you, you know? You see 73 percent of GDP. Don't you analysis? Oh, economic analysis. At the time you were borrowing, economic, you could see 73 percent of GDP. And what analysis? was your justification for you borrowing at 73 percent? Let, 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 let me help us. I'm not done. No. Okay, no, no, answer the question. I wanted to move on. Answer the question. Can you check your guess? Yes, yes. I think he wasn't trained in a good school. Very, very good school. We reject that. Join to We reject that. Bernard, mm -hmm. what is my worry? But Dr. Baumia made an argument about capital expenditure percentages. And you see, when you borrow, it is important that you invest them also in areas that can repay the debt in future. Mm. Because they're going to borrow for 40 years. 41 years. And sometimes they make the point that, oh, it is all because of how great the economy is now. Okay. Could you, investors don't make their decisions 40 years from now based on just what is happening now. That's my first point. My second point is that if you look at the way they have been investing, it makes the management of Ghana's debt very, very unsustainable. You see a decline from the time that we left off in the percentage 
of the expenditures that we were pushing into infrastructure as compared to this. Okay. Let, 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 let me do something quickly. And I quickly need to comment on this clip. We have 12 minutes. I quickly need to comment on this. Let me just help you. I'm going to just read something to conclude this. So IMF did a death as an habit analysis of Ghana. Three key points. And IMF has even discredited no, let me some just of the let, let me just read. The article four report. That is not true. You know about that, that is not true. You know so, they so, disagree so with the complication. Please put up their mic so I can read. And we've explained what it is. There are three things. The authorities agreed. First thing, the Ghanaian authorities agreed with the death analysis results of the IMF and are taking steps to improve their dynamics and secure debt sustainability. Two, the overall risk rating of debt distress is assessed to be high. Three, Ghana's public debt is deemed sustainable based on the authority's sustained commitment to fiscal consolidation, prudent borrowing. So 55%. Oh, let me, fin let, let, let me finish. 73%. Can I, fin can, can I just finish? I, I, think, I think we need to educate the public. Okay. Let me just finish. So number one, they agreed with the results. So you, your government agreed with what IMF is saying. Number two, the overall risk rating of debt distress is assessed to be high. Number three, Ghana's public debt is deemed sustainable based on the authority's sustained commitment to fiscal consolidation, prudent borrowing, and proactive debt management initiatives guided by their MTDS and recent past fiscal responsibility law. So this is where we end that discussion. I want no, to no, move... I need to no, we have only 10 minutes. I beg you. 30 seconds. Can we, can we move into... Can we move into the bank? Can we move into the financial sector? Can we move into the financial sector when we come back from the break? And let's talk about social sector, because I think that those two things are key for people, health, education and also the financial sector. This is the point of view. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the point of view. Tonight we're trying to understand the state of the economy. We've just done macroeconomics. We've done a bit of the CPI. We haven't even touched on free SHS at all. I have a lot of comments I'll be reading shortly. I just wanted to show you on the screen what the CPI situation is for the past 10 years so that you don't think that we're just here to argue. So the, the lowest in the series was in 2009. Now, Kojo, if you had to go by your argument, <laughs> we'll give that to Kufo. And I'll totally explain to you why. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The lowest in the series is yes. 2009. Yes. Don't, for, don't forget that's 39. Yes. The best in the series is 2014. Yes. That's Mahama. 20, Mahama. Uh, 48. Mm. So if you're saying that we should give the uh, 40 to Mahama, yes. then we have to give the 39 to Kufo. Absolutely. And let me explain to you why. Because in election years, Are you back to can CPI? I make my point? In election years, what the NDC does is that they spew a lot of allegations out there. And I'll demonstrate to you. Give me a minute. Allegations out there, which in the minds of people, when the perception is tested, appear as though there's corruption. In 20, and this 2009 is reflective of the 2018 data gathered. This is when they cooked up bank accounts of MPP government officials, sharing it all over. This is when Fifi Kwete said that Ghana's gold reserves had been stolen by Kufu and sent abroad. I can give you a whole catalog of the allegations they came up with. Never said that. Oh, actually, please, actually, he did, he did, fair, he did, fair, he did and, and later he returned. Actually, to be fair, the lowest is 38.5, 2011, 2011. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. How are you taking that 2011 as well? How are you taking that 2011? But substantively, I just have 30 seconds to after, make a point. You were you coming to me. I have 30 seconds just to make a point. They didn't spew unfounded allegations. And where did it go? Your flag bearer. Where did it go? Your flag bearer. Where did it go? Said the no, rich no, no. Here's my have been inflated. L let's deal with. Here's my let's specific. Deal with. Here's my Your specific. I just need 30 seconds on economics and then I'll move. Uh, okay, 30 okay. seconds. Yes. You see, if Dr. Baumia poses a question in 2016, mm -hmm. that you've moved us from 9 billion to 122 billion, explain to us what you have done with the money. And up till now, up till now, today, 2020, the NDC has not been able to explain the exchange differentials, the new drawdowns, etc. You cannot stop us when you think you only want to repeat that question. You cannot stop us from now providing the better um, answers. And that is why we draw your attention to the debt sustainability analysis, which they struggle okay, to defend. Now, now, have, now, let, 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 let me wrap nicely. Yeah. Your most important social intervention has been free SHS. Absolutely. Your biggest claim and the Mahama was infrastructure. No, they said they were going no, to No, do... no, no, just allow. So I'm, I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you two minutes to explain, explain why the free SHS is such a game changer for you. And then you will wrap up, re react to the free SHS and talk about infrastructure. Good idea. So you have two minutes. Please start Great now. idea. Free but SHS, you on time. No, you free SHS <laughs> is life transforming because it equips the most important resource of this country, the human beings. Mm -hmm to increase their productivity in the years ahead of us. Okay. There's this old argument of, let's finish building the schools before we put people through. Whose child should sit home? 
Our view is that you put all the kids in school, give them an equal opportunity to get an education today. Because tomorrow, when these kids are these computer uh, programmers, etc., like we're seeing all over the world, they are those who are going to yield the productivity of billions. One of the challenges has been double track, and we've explained two things. Double track is a temporary measure, but it is also necessary to ensure that everybody gets an opportunity today, even while we construct some more infrastructure and take away the double track and put us back onto uh, the single track platform. So for us, investing in people's lives, like what we are doing, 1.2 million. I'm not sure any other intervention you can point to. New people going to No, 1.2 million beneficiaries. If you talk of new people, that's about, I think, about 30% of that number. Okay, who we can directly say because of free SHS now have an extra opportunity that they would not have um, had because the enrollment numbers as we see them, I think about 60% uptick. They Half say double that. track is because infrastructure issues or something. They, there's a, I think there are criticism about double track. Yes, which is what we've explained. But that, of course, there's not enough infrastructure up in issue. So what do you do? Do you say somebody's child should stay home? No. In the initial stages, let's have a double track system. And at the same time, let us work to have some more infrastructure and roll onto single track, which is what we are doing now. And, and, now, and, and now a number of the schools are beginning to complete their infrastructure projects and hopefully we'll be rolling off the double track. And we believe that this is a life transforming initiative for the Quick people of Ghana. Quick reaction to free HHS and then infrastructure. The NDC as a midwife, okay, is a predecessor administration of the 1992 constitution, okay? The NDC implemented F cube, which by far affects more people than free SHS. The NDC started progressively free SHS. The NDC is never against free SHS. That is why right from the word go when they introduced double track, the NDC said we shall abolish the double track. The MPP argued at the time that double track even allowed for more contact hours. And so the question now is if double track truly allows for more contact hours. Why are you trying to abolish it after we said we were going to abolish it? But my brother, so far, if you look at Minister Kenoforiate's budget estimates and then the outends all the way from 2017 up to the 2020, and the 2021, you cannot say that has been spent. The total that they are spending on free SHS comes to 5.6 billion Ghana cities. Kojo, you can check with the various budget Since inception. estimates. Since inception. Inception, 5.6 billion Ghana cities. If you look at the revenue just from the oil sector, the hydrocarbon sector alone, as a result of President Mohammed's addition of new oil fields to the hydrocarbon fields, Ghana is making 20 billion Ghana cities between 2017 and 2022. Which oil did so one fourth. So one fourth of that is spent on free SHS. Stay on point. Yes. So about one fourth of that yeah. is spent on free SHS. That's correct. That Allah, is true. Allah. Just focus that is on true. Forget twenty billion. Focus. Check your no, own. I'm saying which check oil your, field did Muhammad is over? Check your own budget. No, which oil field did Muhammad is over? We are talking about. You are taking his bid. Just so, so, so. Just five true. Five point six divided by twenty billion. It's just about a quarter of that. So assuming they just spent just oil money on. Free SHS. They are left with over 14 billion Ghana cities to spend on other things. Look at the massive borrowing that they have also done. Look at the massive tax and revenue that they have also raked in. And so we are saying that they have been abysmal in terms of managing the resources of this country. To whom much is given, much is expected. And so it is surprising that we are not seeing the kind of Kwame Nkrumah interchanges that we saw under President Mahama. Oh, it is surprising that we are not seeing the kind of Kaswa interchange that we saw under President Mahama. We are not seeing the kind of rate hospital which is providing quality health care to Ghanaians. We are not seeing the kind of University of Ghana Medical Center that we saw under President Mahama, which they have so mismanaged. And look, anytime I think about University of Ghana Medical Center, I think about what happens to the warranties therein. We have not made full use of the equipment in there. And assuming that the warranties have expired, when we begin to use them and we begin to encounter problems, who is going to pay for that? Is that financial loss? Look at the bank hospital. That is okay. also there, wasted. And that is why President Mahama has said that he will abolish the double track system. He will fast track the completion of the community day senior high schools. He will also, in terms of the education sector, Provide for the six new regions mm. 
universities for okay. all of them and scrap the teacher licensure exam Let me just read a few comments sector. for you guys. As now, I move to the infrastructure. You know, we have to correct the factual ignorance. Let me just talk about the infrastructure. Good evening, Ben. I am Prince from Korea. I think this present government has added flesh to the normal governance responsibility like digitization. PFG, to mention a few, they must be commended for this. Ben, if the government says they've delivered 78% of their manifesto promises and the country looks like what we are seeing and feeling, then either their manifesto was hollow or empty or there was no country at all. This is here from Dan Suman. Hello, Bernard. Ask Mr. Ponkrama his personal view on the exclusion of technical skills from FSHS, especially at this time when we are talking industrialization in Ghana. And then, finally, from Dockers, tell the Minister of Information that we, the customers of defunct savings and loans and farm managers, are really suffering. I doubt if the government is aware of this. Okay. So, sat to my right is Kojo Ponkrama, and sat to my left is Dr. Manibuama. Somebody wiser than me said, when we go right, nothing will be left. But when we go left, nothing will be right. So you decide where you sit. But Think about that. No my name is Bernard Avle. Thank you very much for watching the point of view. My name is Bernard Avle. See you next time. Bye bye. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on City TV's YouTube channel. Subscribe for more videos on The Point of View. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you. The Point of View with Bernard Avle. Monday and Wednesday nights only on City TV.